The following is a presentation of the Gear Radio Network. From wherever we decide studios, broadcasted live on iTunes, Spreaker, and worldwide, this is the Turnbuckle Talk Radio Podcast with your host, the producer, Pat G. The G stands for gangsta. And now kick back and get ready for the eargasms. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the year-end edition, the final TTRP of 2019. Unfortunately, due to the Christmas holidays, our schedules are a little mixed up, but we are here, the year-end review, the final episode for 2019, as we head to the roaring 20s. Myself, Patchy, along with Dan Fury, how are you tonight? You know, uh, I'm recovering from the holiday lag. I mean, we had Thanksgiving, we had Christmas, we had Hanukkah, we had Kwanzaa, we had Festivus for the rest of us. I mean, it was it was a real crazy month since Thanksgiving, but it's also been a crazy year in wrestling, and I can't wait to sit down on tonight's TTRP and have a very good conversation about what a great year 2019 was and, and what, what we're heading into in the roaring 20s. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that there's still radio stations out there playing Christmas music is beyond me, but that's besides the point. <laughs> hey, yeah, don't, don't be a Grinch, all right? No, not at all. Anyway, going into the end of 2019, we got some major stories going on as a name that obviously everybody in wrestling knows, Jim Cornette, who has a podcast, who is a very well-versed man in the professional wrestling world because he's been in it for 30-plus years, has finally come up in a lawsuit, so to speak. Um, It's one of them things of... It's 2019, people. All right? Jim Cornette is one of them opinionated people because he still, to a degree, lives in the world of kayfabe. And he wants wrestling, he wants pro wrestling to be pro wrestling. He doesn't want pro wrestling to be a spot monkey fest. And, of course, this comes on the thing where he filed a federal trademark lawsuit against G-Raver and shirt vendors um, because of a shirt, I guess, that basically has the term of F. Jim Cornette. Huh. Well, that's a conundrum. Um, you know, because no one cared when the the FDM shirts came out for fuck Dave Meltzer. Although, you know, he, that's that's beside the point. Um, you know, Jim Cornette has had a rough go of it over the last couple months, ever since his uh, firing from NWA and the fact that you know he. He kind of found himself in the hot seat with the Ethiopian comment that he made. But at the same token, like you said, he, he lives very much in this wanting to keep things kayfabe and, and all that. Do, do I think he's got a leg to stand on as far as this uh, lawsuit goes? Uh, you know, people have won lawsuits for for stranger. Um, you know, I think that this might be Cornette's way of trying to... Uh, have it so that his good name isn't besmirched because Jim Cornette 
whether people want to to take the last couple months of his career and boil it down to its essence is oh he's a racist piece of shit he's also one of the greatest minds that there was in professional wrestling he gave opportunities to young guys and to older talent um, I don't think he gets much of the recognition like maybe an Eric Bischoff or uh, Paul Heyman or Avon Eric or even uh, a Graham or a Dusty Rhodes for that matter I think a yeah. lot of people see him as being more of a, a manager character than a backstage um, creative uh, genius that he, he was he was able to put together some really amazing shit do I think that you know this this kind of F Jim Cornette movement is really a, a big thing that he should be suing over. I mean, his his name is kind of getting berated, and, and maybe he wants some some monetary compensation for defamation of character and, and all that. Um, do I think it, it's got legs? Sure. I, I think if it was brought to the right court and they saw where it was potentially damaging to his income and his his future earnings, then yeah, I definitely see where he could get something out of this. Um, you know, Hulk Hogan got over a hundred million dollars from Gawker. Yeah, that's true. Put them out of business. And- <coughs> That can ever happen. Well, what's funny about the whole Jim Cornette situation, and yes, he he made the Ethiopian line in regards to Trevor Mur- Trevor Murdoch on NWA. But what was funny is wrestling people that are on Twitter because we live in the age of social media went back and found him essentially saying the same exact line from an episode of like WWE F superstars in like the early 90s late 80s, early 90s, and it was all over Twitter and was like, hey, he said it before, but in Fort, and Cornette even came out, he's like, it wasn't a race joke, it was a, it was a food joke. But yeah. this is the thing, this is the difference of times, because in 2019, as everyone knows, we live in a cancer culture society. Yeah. And everyone wants the virtue signal first. Yeah. And this is the thing is people are always like, hey, and there was, like I said, wrestling fans and everything on Twitter was like, hey, this is a line that he has said before, guys. It's nothing new. Like, and Cornette came out and he's like, it's not a, he addressed it. He's like, it wasn't, he, apologized for it and everything. He yeah. did did the right thing, apologizing. But he's like, it was never a race thing. It was a, it was purely a hunger, it was a hunger thing. Yeah, I mean, to, to be fair to, to Jim Cornette on this one, okay, South Park is a form of entertainment. Yes, it is. That has some of, that has some of the highest ratings uh, it's had in, in years, okay? This season has been positively brutal, okay? It has, because they because everything Trey and Matt, Trey, Trey, Trey Parker and Matt and Matt have essentially taken this season of South Park and addressed every wrong thing that has ever been said about them in South Park and they and they turned it into a season and and then on top of it they took they took everything from today and addressed it in in a certain way exactly and they and it's funny and I, this is all gonna this is all gonna come around okay uh, they are a form of entertainment that makes inappropriate jokes okay even they this season have taken flack over the transgender uh, episode. Yep. Uh, it, but the funny part about that was is that they, for 25 seasons, have mocked every single thing under the sun. Not limited to, but including uh, the Jewish religion, Jews, Mel Gibson, Paris Hilton, uh, Mecca Streisand, Christmas, Santa Claus, and Jesus both did blow this season. Yep. Okay? They did blow in the Christmas special. And people were like, this this issue 
is is off limits and you cross the line and South Park should be taken off the air. And everyone just every person who's seen South Park through the years was like, this one? Like, this is the hill you guys want to try and die on? Okay, good luck. And, and what's funny is just like, it was like a season, season or two ago, maybe even three, like Matt and Trey came out and they had the hashtag cancel South Park. They were daring, they were daring Comedy Central to cancel them and Comedy Central was like, no, you guys are like one of our highest rated shows. Of all, uh, it's the most consistent show that they've had. Plus, it just got $500 million to run on HBO Max starting this, this upcoming year. Yep. Exclusive rights. Now, here's where I bring this all back. Okay, it's entertainment. Uh, sometimes statements are made that are, are in joke. I mean, South Park made Starving Mar- Starvin Marvin a, a, a character, a running character for over 20 seasons. Okay, what is he? He's a starving Ethiopian. <laughs> they have they have Christmas poop. They have Christmas poop. Okay, Jim Cornette making that comment, it wasn't a racial comment, and I can see where Jim Cornette is coming because he was making light of the poverty of the Ethiopian people, which he, even then, he people could be like, well, that's not nice. It's like it's a, it, it, it's kind of like comedy you know you can you can watch uh, Liza Schlesinger or you can watch Dave Chappelle or you can watch Melissa McCarthy or you can if you don't like it don't watch it I mean make an impact in the ratings if, if it really offended you but to get back to it it's like you know do, do I think that Jim Cornette has a firm stand on the lawsuit We'll see. I mean, only time will tell. I definitely think that we need to give it a little bit of time to die down. And, you know, you'll probably see Jim Cornette pop up somewhere. Um, And, you know, hopefully it's in a meaningful way. And people are just like, whatever. Like, he said something stupid. WWE has said worse Stop. Come on, literally. Okay, they're running. They're running a merit. They're running a cheating slash marriage storyline with a woman that, in reality, is married to the man that she's storyline divorced on television. Exactly, and I mean tonight they're having a wedding. Yeah, Ooh, you know, uh, it's just like, uh, hey, you know what? <laughs> more power to Lana and Rusev because it's gotten them on TV and everything, especially Uh Lana, but come on, everybody in this world that we live in where essentially yes, kayfabe is dead, plain and simple, because like Undertaker has a Twitter Yeah, Undertaker has an Instagram as we as we have claimed, as we have quoted Everybody knows it's like unless unless you legitimately hear hear the news news or whatever, which I guarantee if Lana and Rusev got divorced, it would be all over Twitter by somebody. Oh yeah. There are there are nineteen billion freaking wrestling journalists out there that break stories left and right every day of every minute. And then on top of it, some of the some of the things that they break are dumb and stupid, and then some of them are interesting, like the next subject, and that being Lars Sullivan. And of course, Lars Sullivan is a mountain of a man who was got a massive push with NXT and then into the main roster and when he got called up to the main roster, suddenly disappeared. This is due to Lars Sullivan dealing with anxiety and mental health issues and and everything. So WWE's like, okay, go do you. Fix what you gotta do. Fix what you gotta do. And then when he came back, he injured himself, was back out, and now it seems like there he's was getting ready to come make a comeback, and then the news broke about him making comments years ago on a blog, which he apologized for, so that delayed it even more, and then now we're back to here, where he was going to be a return, and the story breaks about Lars Sullivan being in gay porn. There is nothing wrong 
uh, I'm going to preface this. There is nothing wrong with making porn. No, not at all. Not at all. However, um, people are acting like um, this is a, a huge uh, issue. People are acting like this is, is somehow news breaking uh, from from my understanding, I think part of the reason that this broke was because he had also made some homophobic remarks in the past. Yes, that that was that's what delayed his that's what delayed his return uh, originally earlier this year. So uh, he made some homophobic remarks, and then all of a sudden, you find out that he was in uh, gay porn. So. Is it is it just desserts? Is it once again virtue signaling? Like, oh hey, you said this stuff. Well, guess what? You you were gay for pay. Fuck off. Um, there's my only f bomb for the night. Do I think that this is newsworthy? Man, no. Nah. Like, I don't think that this is newsworthy. So the dude did porn that happened to be gay porn. That really, to me. It, it, it kind of doesn't matter. Does he have talent? Does he have, you know, skills when it comes to his in-ring performance? That's, to me, what really matters. I mean, we have, and I, I can understand why WWE is throwing him on the back burner, if not probably going to give him future endeavors over this, because they've had similar incidences where, you know, wrestlers have not disclosed that they have posed nude or done uh, adult films. Yep. And then it comes out and then, well, you, you lied. So we have to fire you. I believe in the all women's NXT season that they had, wasn't there like a six foot eight or a six foot nine female wrestler that was up on the show and then all of a sudden it came out that she posed Yeah, and then she ended up she ended up in impact. I can't remember her name. Yeah, like I know that this this kind of sucks that we can't just rattle her name off at the top. But I mean, she didn't even pose nude. She posed in like slinky lingerie that was kind of almost see through, and they were like, "You're fired." Well, I mean, six years ago you were having bra and panties and jello matches, and then all of a sudden, like, "Oh no, we can't, we can't show almost a nipple." You know, we can't show the dirty dark skin. It's like to me. This is just going to cause some more issues for Lars Sullivan as far as his mental health, and I guess that that's the the avenue that I'm worried about is how is this going to affect him? How is this going to affect his ability to make money? Um, you know, is this going to be kind of be the final nail in the coffin where they give him future endeavors and then he he leaves professional wrestling? To me, I mean, there there's nothing wrong with making porn. Yeah, I, well, there's nothing wrong with making. Porn. There's nothing wrong with it, and it seems like it wasn't. It was just wrestling fans that found out because I guess from the clips that they had seen or whatever, um, his initials are tattooed on his body. He's his DM. His, his name is Dave Miley or whatever, and people people like wrestling fans found this there's been no statement by WWE all that we know is Lars Sullivan has pretty much deleted his Twitter and all his social media accounts once again so he's not made a statement and it seems like it's he's also shut himself off from the world from various reports not 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 really talking to anybody so it's one of the things of alright well this dude does deal with anxiety and and, and whatnot. So it's like, hmm, all right. Well, how bad is this affecting his mental health? And if, and is there anybody talking to him? Which, from this, what it's been reported is he's not had contact with anyone really. Yeah, and I mean, this this is a, a weird situation to find yourself in. I mean, and this could be detrimental to his job. And to me, if, if fans are doing this in a mocking fashion, like, oh, you said these comments and, hey, we found out you did, you know, gay porn, then, or same-sex porn, who, who what kind of life do you have that you're trolling Pornhub 
in order to find, you know, Lars Sullivan. Like, how many months of investigative reporting did you have to do in order to do this? It's like, you know, like, he, he clearly was a young guy when he did this. He's a mature adult now. I mean, he, so you want to, like, completely ruin his life because you want to want to want to be an asshole like to me i just hope that this doesn't derail his his professional wrestling career he was good in nxt he was about to be making a big splash again on on raw i mean it's royal rumble season he probably would have made an appearance i mean they could have had something down the pipe for him andre the giant memorial battle royal win who knows you know yeah seemed to like him I mean, they were really pushing him hard, but, you know, at the end of the day, this, this all could have been just, this all could have just been left alone. Yeah, absolutely. And this is the thing is there's been over the last week, week and a half, two weeks, because it being Christmas and, and it being the holidays and everything, there's not really been a whole lot of like wrestling news going on. Like, and whatnot. So it's funny, like, when you see some of, when I'm on Twitter and I see some of the, the posts from some of these websites and it's just like, really? That's news to you? Yeah, like, let's, let's talk about other stuff. You know what I mean? Like, there's tons of wrestling news that, that is out there. Um, and to me, this is this is the news you want to this is the news you want to talk about this of all things you wouldn't be you would not be making fun in fact I'll go out on a limb okay so didn't um, Tony Storm have some precarious photos released earlier this year yes she did okay and Twitter just jumped on it and was like don't you do that you know this is this is mean you're ridiculing her because she did this and and she's a strong woman and blah 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 you're doing that and then all of a sudden because it's a dude you're just like ah fuck it Let, let's make fun of him let's make memes of Triple H doing the Triple H point next to him in an AW root beer shirt ha 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 this is funny it's like there's no one to be like hey you know that's kind of fucked up yeah, and this and what's and this is the funny thing is there's so much wrestling content going on because you have WWE, you have AEW, you have NXT, you have Impact Wrestling, you have New Japan, you have the Independence. There's so much going on that it's like one of the things of not everything is newsworthy and it's one of the things of being 2019 and I think with WWE's approach of joint of getting the deal from Fox and wanting Fox wanting to give them more of a sports sports feel uh-huh. with Kind of with the with the backstage program and the and the WWE bump and and whatnot. I feel like it's time that we, as we're entering a new decade, that maybe wrestling news kind of takes a page from sport from their from their counterparts and sports in general because. To be honest, yeah, like there's times where sports re- re- will report things that are like, really, you're going to report that. But it's still newsworthy because it's newsworthy. But with wrestling, it's like almost everybody will report everything because there's so many people out there that consider themselves wrestling journalists because they have a podcast or they have this or they have that. But they're not on the level of of Bully Ray doing Busted Open Radio or a um, or Fightful dot com or even even Ryan Satin who does the what the one spot on WWE backstage with the news and notes and everything that he runs he runs his own wrestling news website. 
Mm-hmm. They're not on that level, but because they have a wrestling podcast, they want to, they, they, they get a report from somebody or they hear a report from somebody, whether it be the dirt sheets online someplace that no one really knows of or whatnot. It's like, hey, this is a report. And the next thing you know, you see 1,900 other people pick it up. Not everything is newsworthy, guys. Yeah, and I mean, to me, this was not newsworthy. This was not needed. This was just kind of crap. This was filler crap because people have nothing else um, to report on. I mean, other than maybe you could be talking about Randy Orton getting injured, people. You know, dude, dude might be sidelined for a while, but instead you want to talk about you know, gay porn and have Jim Cornette. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like the video, of Randy Orton possibly getting injured. It's he, he, Randy Orton even came out too. Uh, and what's funny is like Randy Orton came out immediately, shortly after the, after the video and everything. And people, the the main the main sites had reported that he had a potential injury. He's like, he's like, I'm going to address it tomorrow night on Raw. And then everybody is like, Oh, Randy Orton's going to address this on the Raw. Same thing with Becky Lynch. Becky Lynch earlier today sends out a. Um, tweet that hmm, mentions contract and whatnot, and people are like running with that, running with that, and it's like you don't even know what's going on. Like she sent out like a a tweet that's very just mysterious that mentions a, a contract with was like mentioned the line of oh. What, like contract and re-signing and whatnot, and people are just running with it. Like Becky Lynch is gonna jump or whatever. I'm like, really? No. Shut up. Yeah, yeah. You know, we'll, we'll just see that iceberg melt in hell on that one. So it, it's I love how 2019 is ending. Yeah, yeah. It, it's ridiculous, but. It's one of the things of, like I said, not everything has to be reported because I've seen, oh my God, I've seen stories on just the most random, random of things, like the most random of things. And it's like, really? Why are, why is this even a story? Why? It's like, why is this even a story? Or, or um, somebody bring, like, somebody brought up something with The Miz and Daniel Bryan, and I was just like, why? It's one, it's one of the things that as we wind up, as we wind up 2019 to be finished out here, it's just like, yeah, pro wrestling's at an all-time high because you have all this content, but because you have all this content, you have a a shit ton of content that's just dumb and stupid. Yeah, I mean, let's let's have some real good stuff coming into to twenty twenty as far as what what is newsworthy. I mean, people could be talking about a potential AEW New Japan crossover match. Um, <laughs> yeah, technically, that's kind of what's happening in a couple days at Wrestle Kingdom. But we could have an actual business deal that we don't know about, and instead, you want to talk about Lars Sullivan? Like, come on! Like, there's bigger news in pro wrestling, and plus. This is a dude's life. This is a dude's livelihood. And what he did when he was a younger man. I mean, we've all made stupid mistakes. We're, we're you know, let, let's look at it. We're pretty much just primates until we reach like our mid 30s. And even then, we're not very smart. You know, I mean, we're only as smart as the technology that we have, basically. So, whatever this guy did in his younger years, let's hope that. The guy can get his life back on track. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I will say this: it it's one of the things of all you have to do is look at Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy hosted, returned to host Saturday Night Live after tons of years away. Had probably the t- top rated episode of SNL in years. Crushed it. Crushed it. Um, had the opening monologue with himself, Dave Chappelle, Tracy Morgan, and Chris Rock, and three Keenan Thompson. And Keenan Thompson, who 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 just threw out the random white dude that was trying to get in on it. And what's funny is it's like they made the they all made the joke of 
Mur- Eddie Murphy, Chris Rock, and Dave Chappelle was like, yep, yeah, we're rich. Thanks, Netflix. And then Tracy Morgan's like, I got my money from a car accident. <laughs> <laughs> and what's funny is in the prelude to like him going up, and he even talked about it, he's like, he's looked back at some of the content he said, and he brought up like his jokes about AIDS and everything. He's like, He's like, I made them jokes when I was 21 and, and uninformed. I, 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 14 years later or whatever, I'm like, I'm 36 and I'm informed. So are you going to are you going to hold a 21 year old kid that's an uninformed responsible for responsible for something that a 36 year old uh, informed man is apologizing for? Yeah, I mean, exactly. I think one of the funniest parts about that entire thing was, is you look back at Eddie Murphy during that time, and it's funny that on a wrestling podcast, we're bringing up Eddie Murphy, but it it works for the context of the Lars Sullivan conversation. Yeah, Eddie Murphy's raw and delirious, I dare you, I double dog dare you. If you're a listener of this podcast and you have not heard it, please, before Eddie Murphy does another Netflix special or a Netflix special, go and watch that and see just how freaking how much of a terror that man was he was 21 years old selling out Madison Square Garden just destroying everyone yep. in his way including Bill Cosby which if you guys didn't get the whole who's America's dad now joke it was aimed directly at Bill Cosby due to something that was said to him by Bill Cosby about his profanity and language yep. that he addressed in his comedy special and I mean that goes to show you just how bizarre the world is where Eddie Murphy, who was raunchy and disgusting at age 21, could become one of the most beloved comedic figures of all time. Meanwhile, the guy that was telling him, oh, you shouldn't swear, oh, it's not family friendly, was drugging and raping women for decades. Yeah, and this is the thing, and Eddie Murphy addressed it. He's like, who would have thought, who would have thunk it that I would have turned into the guy living at home with 10 kids and the guy and everybody that everybody that thought everybody who thought was America's dad's in jail. Exactly. Prison. Straight up prison for the rest of his miserable life. Rotten hell, you piece of shit. Yeah. (laughs) But that's going to do it for us for the first half. And we're going to take a small break, do pay some bills. We're going to come back and have a year in review and preview the big events that are coming up this New Year's Day in from New Japan because, oh, man, those cards are loaded. Uh, And, you know, we have so much in the year in review. I mean, God, what a great year. Yeah. This is the best time to be a pro wrestling fan. Oh, absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Padgy from the Turnbuckle Talk Radio Podcast. And no, we're not talking pro wrestling today, but we are talking sports hoodies, NFL, NBA, MLB, NHL, soccer, and much more. And this is brought to you by HouseOfHoodies.com, a new sponsor here at the TTRP. You can visit TheHouseOfHoodies.com and pick up your favorite team's merchandise. They have current players, former players, or you can customize your own hoodie, whether it be the NBA, NHL, MLB, and the NFL. After you're done shopping, use the promo code TTR Podcast and you will get 15% off your order. That's TTR Podcast for 15% off at thehouseofhoodies.com. Back here, TTRP, Pat G, Dan Fury, of course, wrapping up 2019 and the year that it was, and boy, was it a year of wrestling. We saw people leaving WWE, people changing new company, changing companies, 
a new wrestling company starting um, lots of changes, a rise in a third in the third brand of WWE and much, much more, of course. And you just got to You got to admit, man, it's just been a wild ride, like for pro wrestling all year. Uh, yeah, you know, let's let's look at just how amazing the year in pro wrestling has been coming up this past year. Okay, so couple couple things that shocked me. Okay, you had the rise of the man. Yep. Okay, you had the all women's main event at WrestleMania. Yep. The triple threat match. Yep. In the same weekend that you had New Japan and Ring of Honor sell out Madison Square Garden, something we never thought we'd see another wrestling promotion come in and do that. Uh, Jay Lethal in the being the first African American in a main event in Madison Square Garden. Exactly. You had you started the year out finding out that AEW was a thing. Yep. All Elite Wrestling. Okay. You had these waves of. Uh, information coming about a new, you know, TNT finally getting pro wrestling back on. NWA Power running a weekly show. Impact rising from the ashes of of what we all thought was just going to be just another promotion that failed. It came back hard with Sammy Callahan at, at the, the lead, the charge. Uh, yeah, and, well, t- not to mention it was Sammy Callahan and Tessa Blanc. Blanchard. Yes, okay. Uh, duly noted, Tessa Blanchard as well. <laughs> um, you had a lot of surprises. You had billion dollar deals being made in order to acquire rights to shows. More importantly than that, you had some of the best matches and reinventions of people's characters and you have got to give it to to pro wrestling fans today. We are the luckiest sons of bitches on planet Earth to be able to have all of this at the tips of our fingers, all of this content Content 24-7. And that that was just one year. Yep. It absolutely was. It was you saw you saw a guy, you saw people, you saw the big movements of people leaving the WWE for just because of they thought they their time was done. They they needed a break or whatever. Show up other places and completely reinvent themselves. And or people that have already reinvented themselves up on the independents and other companies reinvent themselves even more to to establish to establish just another chapter in their story. You, you know, one of the the prime people that we are referring to is John Moxley, yep. who left WWE and did the right thing by letting his contract just he, expire. He finished up his he finished up his contract. He he, he worked to the end. Yep, and then shows up. On the first official AEW pay per view, double or nothing, makes a huge impact on the business. Starts cutting some amazing promos, then goes over to Japan, to New Japan Pro Wrestling as Mox, and takes on Juice Robinson and wins the United States Championship from Juice uh, Robinson, making him one of only two people to ever hold both the WWE and New Japan United States Championships, the other person being Shinsuke Nakamura, I believe, no, and AJ Styles, no, not AJ Styles, Shinsuke Nakamura. Yeah, Shinsuke. Shinsuke, thank you. Uh, to me, it's that. Um, you, know, you can correct me on that if I'm wrong. But, I mean, you look at this amazing 
year for just John Moxley being able to reinvent himself, and then he comes back and just starts having some killer wrestling matches in Japan, and then is telling some great stories in AEW uh, with Kenny Omega, the big belt, the best belt machine. Um, you know, their their death match was positively brutal and another star that left WWE and reinvigorated their career was Dustin Rhodes who left a very cushy position could have you know ridden high and made some very good money as a producer for WWE instead decides to go with his brother uh, who forms AEW and the Cody Dustin match at Double or Nothing was one of the best matches of the year, period. Yes, it was. It was it was everything it was everything that a wrestling match should be. It was it was gory. It was emotional. I mean you rid a wave of emotions from start to finish because, you know, we didn't know what Dustin was able to pull out. I mean, he's in phenomenal shape for any age. I mean, he's the natural Dustin Rhodes for a reason. And then Cody coming out and being the throne breaker and sending a clear message to WWE and specifically Triple H that you know, this is competition. You guys wanted it. You guys were creating your own competition within the company. Now we are your competition. I thought it was a, a, a great match. It told a, a beautiful story. And by the end, you had Dustin Rhodes and Cody Rhodes hugging in the center of the ring as, you know, as Dusty would say, the crimson mask with all over Dustin Rhodes' face, baby. And it was just so. I mean, it sucked you in. I want. I must have watched that match on repeat seven or eight times. Yeah. In a row. Just my jaw dropped. Like, what? First off, he's bleeding like a stuck pig. Secondly, he's just going. And then, of course, the meme gold that came out of that match with you know Dustin bleeding and artists making cartoons of you know, him in panel boxes where the blood just won't stop and it drowns him. It's hilarious stuff. But AEW managed to also solidify themselves back at in Chicago at Sears Center where now All Out is going to be a yearly event there. It's going to take place every year, same time, just like All In. And they are going to, to kind of make that potentially their WrestleMania. And they got a great deal with TNT. And now a lot of the stars of the independents that we've heard about through the years are starting to make their way to that company. And we're about to start seeing Seeing some names potentially going over there from companies that we've seen. And the cool part is, is that this is all being held together. This ship, this glue by, by some guys that some of them have made their names only on the independents. Some of them have been to the big show and wanted to risk it all in order to do this. And some of them reinvented themselves 100% and became El Champion, you know, with a little bit of the bubbly. Chris Jericho. Yeah, and this is the thing is, Chris Jericho, I've been a huge fan of Chris Jericho from his days and the independence, like Mexico and Germany and the tape trading days and everything. I've been a fan for Jericho for years. And whether you hate him or love him, Jericho's just been one of the, he's been in my top five for the longest time. And the fact that this man can just continue to reinvent himself, but he's also at the point where he knows his career is coming to an end at an end. And he's, he's going to do what the guys that, that didn't do when he was coming up and that's build the younger talent because truth be told that match with that he and him and jungle boy had was a hell of a match. Every match that Jericho has had in AEW has been a, a, a really good match. Good to great even. Um, you know, he, 
his Kenny Omega to match, which was done in AEW. It was it was good. It wasn't obviously going to to lead up to the hype of the first one, but that was because we didn't expect it. Okay, you can't capture lightning in a bottle twice. It was a good match. <laughs> yeah. Okay, he has had matches with Darby Allen, where Darby Allen had his hands tied behind his back. What the shit? And it still made sense. He's taken guys and brought them up. You know, you have the the sexy god. You you have Jake Hager. You have LAX. You have these guys who you know we've known about or heard about on the indies or seen on WWE that he's brought in with him. I mean, you have got him going against Jungle Boy, like you said. People were like, "Why is this happening?" Jericho said it himself because this is what I want. This is what I. Want. I want to wrestle these guys. He might only do two or three years for this contract. He might go back to WWE afterwards, but he can at least say, hey, I gave him my all. And Jericho is the type of performer that consistently delivers. And that's what it's about. It's consistency. I have yet to see a Chris Jericho match where I, in AEW, where I have said, eh, eh, he didn't need it. I mean, he started out the year back in New Japan, okay, at Wrestle Kingdom, wrestling Naito for the Intercontinental Championship. Yep. Then he did his cruise. Then he does AEW. Then he's doing TNT. He's not to mention, not to mention touring with his band. Not to mention touring with his band, being back in the studio, releasing a bottle of champagne after the the internet sensation that he had with a little bit of the bubble. I mean, the dude. The dude personifies AEW in so many ways, just as much as the Bucks and Cody and Moxley and Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus do. And the best part about this is, is we have talked about in in great lengths, not to, to beat AEW into the ground, about how this is just the start of this company and we could see great things. And it's also bringing out the best of its competition in WWE and NXT because they brought up NXT as now the official third brand. Yep. Gave, it, gave it prime time on USA, two hours. You have some phenomenal stars that are being made out of that. There's been a, a big year for the Undisputed Era, for Keith Lee, for Tommaso Ciampa, Finn Balor returning to NXT and kind of being the veteran that's bringing those guys along. Matt oh, Riddle. by the way, oh. by the way, if you if you're a wrestling fan and you're not salivating at the wins world when worlds collide main event of the undisputed era versus Imperium. Stop being a wrestling fan. I don't turn off this podcast and, and go sit with your face in the corner. No, actually, keep this podcast going. Still go sit with your face in the corner and listen with shame. And, you know, we can talk about, obviously, New Japan Pro Wrestling has continued to tell some great stories. The G1 was great. Th- this year, going into, tw- you know, the Wrestle Kingdom 14, uh, Ibushi is going to be going against Okada for the New Japan Heavyweight Championship. Okay, and there's a there's a potential. There is a potential of a man in New Japan Pro Wrestling walking out of Wrestle Kingdom with two titles. Yes, in Jay White. I mean, Jay White is. We talked about it earlier this year, where Jay White helped. Yo, co-main evented the, the garden. Jay White walked out of Wrestle Kingdom last year looking picture perfect with what he was bringing to the table. And he won the, the New Japan Pro Wrestling Heavyweight Championship belt. He has become the, the gaijin face of that company. And the dude's not even 25 yet. I mean, this is a guy who is making great strides in professional wrestling over there. And, I mean, there's also John Moxley is returning to go back over there. You have uh, Tanahashi versus Chris Jericho with the stipulation that if Tanahashi beats him, Tanahashi gets an AEW championship match. Which Which has been confirmed. New Japan Pro Wrestling has confirmed it. So, Tanahashi, if he beats Chris Jericho, the pain maker... 
in Japan at the Tokyo Dome on the 4th, guess what? Tanahashi shows up on AEW television to wrestle for that belt, which means Tanahashi would be in the United States working for a major televised promotion. Yep. 20, okay. Yep. And that's just that promotion. Then you you mentioned, of course, Ring of Honor, you know, headlining uh uh, the garden where Matt Taven walked out with the title and we end with the oldest ring of honor heavyweight champion in in PCO at the end of the year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you, you've had feuds going on with, within that company that I know a lot of people are like, well, their attendance is down bullshit. Their attendance is, is still good. They're pulling in new stars. That's the best part about pro wrestling is it's cyclic. You might think they're down now, but all it takes is one or two acquisitions that could pop up there. And bickety bam, bickety boom, you know, your fight TV app is blowing up. I mean, Marty Scroll is still repping Ring of Honor. I mean, yes. They're, you know, L, L, you, you can look at Impact and. While it hasn't happened for 2019, obviously, there's a pretty high chance that in 2020, a woman will be a heavyweight, will be the heavyweight champion in a wrestling company. And to to those people who say boohoo on that, now boohoo on you because complete transparency on this one. Those two, being Sammy Callahan and Tessa Blanchard, have lit that company on fire. And Impact is another. Uh, you know, Don Callis has made that company worth watching again. Like those guys acquired the company, brought it back down to a smaller scale, and are producing amazing matches again. And I think that in 2020, you could see Impact making a big comeback. And you know, we we look at that. And then we also can look at NWA Power. Yep. I mean, a couple of years ago, when people found out that, you know, oh, you know, a few years back, uh, Billy Corgan from Smash Pumpkin bought the NWA and the rights and the title. Uh, whatever. Boo hoo on that. Oh, they, they, they're doing this internet show, you know, 10 pounds of gold. Eh, it makes no sense. Oh, Nick Aldis and Cody Rhodes are going to wrestle in Chicago at All In for the NWA title. Uh, I guess I'll watch it. And then now it's gotten to a point where, you know, we we talked about it at the beginning of the show. NWA Power comes out and it's like, holy nostalgia. It looks just like it. Nick Aldis being the NWA champion and a damn good one at that is representing that company extremely well. And Billy Corgan didn't want to go head to head with the major competition. He's letting it simmer. He's bringing the NWA back to, to its roots. Yeah. He doesn't have to tour the company. He can just tour the title and have this small show, and it's still getting eyeballs. And and the thing is, is they have a solid roster as well. Oh, they absolutely do. And one of the things that makes me chuckle is Nick Aldis is probably one of the best. I mean, I, he is signed. He's the NWA World Heavyweight Champion. But he's probably one of the best that's not signed to one of the major companies. But does he need to? He's exposed. His title can travel. It's back to the basics with the NWA Traveling Championship. Billy Corgan you know, masterfully uses him. I mean, it's going to extend his career for years. And the best part about it is the NWA means something again. And all of these are our major competition for WWE who had to step up their game in 2019. I mean, they they went there were a lot of events where people went for broke and guys reinvented themselves and the the company really put the the wagon behind a female being their top star for yeah. the first time a female is the top draw on WWE yep being Becky Lynch of course and, and this is the thing it's it's one of them things of and WWE has found I think WWE's finally found that balance between today's roster and the nostalgia 
And granted, yes, while while everybody does, while the nostalgia is mostly will come in when when they need to and whatnot. And and unfortunately, because the as we call them, the blood money shows are 15 years behind. It's one of the things of WWE has found has found that that balance and I th- and you have to thank one man for that and that's Triple H yes Triple Triple H with all his knowledge and all his and, and all his talent that he's built up through the years his career and everything I honestly I honestly feel better for WWE going into this decade than I was going in at two th- from 2009 to 2010 yeah, I mean, so so let's talk about the E for a minute here. Okay, Becky Lynch, who a lot of people the year prior felt was overlooked, um, underappreciated, especially when Ronda Rousey showed up. Yep. The, the, the spotlight was on her, and of course, Charlotte and, you know, Sasha Banks. Becky, the fans got behind Becky. The fans wanted Becky. The fans got Becky. And she won the Women's Royal Rumble last year. Challenged at WrestleMania for the two titles, uh, the SmackDown Women's Championship and the Raw Women's Championship, in the main event of WrestleMania. Okay, last match, main event. Wins the championship. Ronda Rousey goes home to make babies. Charlotte Flair continues to cement her legacy as she will be because she's Charlotte Flair. Becky Lynch is on the cover of everything. She's the main event. She's on posters, cups, uh, sides of trucks, action figures. She's on the WWE 2K video game with Roman Reigns. So the two baby faces of the company are represented on the game. Okay, she's in the commercials. People know who Becky Two Belts is. Her merchandise flies off the shelves. Not since, you know, not since maybe the emergence of John Cena has a new star come out like that and just, you know, and she's not new. She's familiar with the fans. You know, fans have known her for years. She's one of the the women's revolution. Yeah, she's uh, one of the three faces. Yep. But still, you know, look at it. She she emerged victorious this year. Then there was the Cinderella story, the Cinderella Man story of one of the longest tenured WWE superstars finally getting what I referred to as the Bret Hart break, where Kofi Kingston, who showed up in 2006, headlines WrestleMania against Daniel Bryan, another Cinderella Man story. Kofi Kingston becomes the first African-born WWE champion in one of the biggest fan pushes since Daniel Bryan's Yes Movement so organically unfolded. I mean... Fans have always loved Kofi Kingston, but we thought maybe Kofi is never going to get that spotlight. And they forced WWE's hand into into accepting Kofi Kingston as its champion. They did. Not to not to mention the and that's the thing is as we, we as we're getting close to wrapping up here, this is the thing is yes, the Kofi Kingston run was fan driven just like Daniel Bryan but you also have to remember that in this time yeah Kofi Kingston had had Big E he had Xavier Woods but you also had social media you had people tweeting at WWE you had people Facebooking you had people Instagramming Snapchat all this all because of Kofi Kingston and this is the thing is it's one of the things as that's why I feel comfortable going into the new get decade with Triple H because Triple H has t- has seen all this. He's kind of riven, risen with the times and even WWE has too with the changeover of the guard, so to speak, because earlier this year, you had all that changeover with the agents. You got you got away from the Dean Malenko's and the Arn Anderson's and the Fit Finley's and you brought in Shane Helms and and younger guys that maybe that may be easier to relate with the talent that you have now. 
I mean, they also hired Abyss. Yeah. Uh, Abyss became an agent. Uh, who would have thought a dude who never once wrestled in a WWE ring would end up being an agent? But that's the, the level of talent that they have. And also, you know, NXT no longer being a farm system, but being a new, uh, you know, uh, the third brand, the third official brand, they've had some real strong numbers. Fans were late to their characters. <laughs> Absolutely, and, and this is the thing is, people have said NXT, NXT's like the glorified indie show. NXT's not a glorified indie show. NXT's the wrestling show because of the, but they're, it's guys that can wrestle and also put on a great story. And yeah, absolutely. Without, without the micromanaging and of the of the WWE yes man with Vince McMahon and his and his crew because that's all NXT guys I'm sorry whether you want to believe it or not that's all Paul Levesque Triple H and Sean Hickamanum aka Sean Michaels yeah, and this is, and we've talked about this on previous episodes. Everything we're going to see in WWE going pri- going for- forward is going to be heavily Triple H influenced, and this makes me want to go back to being a fly on the wall in the rides with the click in the vans, talking about how they would do things in pro wrestling, because I think all of that bleeds into what we're seeing today. Oh, absolutely! And what's funny is they've had they've had. Had um, talks with Triple H and Shawn Michaels, and they've even they've even made, had the had the things of like, what does how does NXT relate relate to the quick the click? And both of them have said it's just it's things that should have been done 10, 15 years ago that wasn't. Yeah, because and that's because you had you had because of the times that you were in and at the time that we were in, we were in a war because you had WCW. We don't you don't have that anymore. You have you and Triple H even said he's like, you have all this wrestling because and look at it. There's uh, just the other day. Two people that are part of the WWE NXT UK roster um, purchased Progress Wrestling in England. So that's just that's just another that's going to be just another another company that has a relationship with WWE because of of who owns it. Which just gives more potential for crossover matches and more fun for wrestling fans, which is what professional wrestling is supposed to be, flat out, F-U-N, fun. And, yeah, absolutely. And to wrap this all up in a nice little bow, um, 2020 is going to be a great year for pro wrestling. Just be a fan. Don't, like, yeah. Trust me, these companies are going to do stuff that you hate. These companies are going to do stuff that you love. Just be a fan. Like, just watch it and be a fan. Because I will say this, since I'm no longer in the business as a referee or ring announcer, I'm back to just being a pure wrestling fan. And yeah, I follow I'm, I'll follow guys that I'm friends with and I know and everything through social media and stuff. But I'm back to just being a fan. And trust me, back to when you're back to just being a fan, wrestling is fun again. Especially especially going into a new decade where you have content upon content upon content. So much content. Yeah, and just just to lay back and just sit back and enjoy it. Just like yeah, you're gonna criticize it. That's just pro wrestling, but just enjoy it. That's that's all you can do because in another ten years, the people that are stars today aren't gonna be stars anymore. They'll be they'll be the they'll be the legends that you're hoping come back for a one-off show or something like that. 
because if you really look at it, some of the some of the top talent today, especially within WWE, they're they're all in ten years they're going to be near in fifty. So just like ten years ago when I was twenty six, and you had the you had and the guys that I grew up on, Bret Hart, Steve Austin, and were starting to hit the end of their runs. And whatnot, like that's what that's what it's going to be in 2020. In the next 10 years, you're going to see the you're going to see the end the runs end for an AJ Styles and a Kevin Owens and so many and so many more. And they are going to they they being this roster that we have now is going to be the fan favorites of of kids who are going to grow up and be us. And we are going to be talking about the good old days, much like people did when, you know, Dusty Rhodes and and Ric Flair wrestled in a cage at Greensboro. It's, It's amazing. It's a great time to be a fan. Just live it up and enjoy it. Drink it in. Yeah. As 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 uh, Chris Jericho once said, "Drink it in, man. Drink it in, Drink it in man." So that's where we're gonna leave it. As our year in review is done, we will be back in a few. We'll be back later this week, next week, something around that for the first episode of 2020. As we march to episode 100 of the TTRP. Thank you for listening. For Dan Fury, I'm Pat G. We will see you on the flip side. The Turnbuckle Talk Radio podcast is brought to you by Gear Network and ShopGear.com. We can be listened to via Spotify, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and everywhere else you can get your podcasts. The TTRP introduction was done by Trevor Dugan. The show is hosted by Patrick Ganjewski and Daniel Roberts. Post-production of the TTRP is done by Patrick Ganjewski and John Semino. If you'd like to follow us via social media, You can search Turnbuckle Talk Radio Podcast on Facebook. You can follow us at Twitter by using the name Turnbuckle underscore talk. Or if you have questions or concerns, you can reach us via email at Turnbuckle, T-L-K, radio at gmail.com. We'd like to thank you for listening to the Turnbuckle Talk Radio Podcast, downloading our episodes, following us on social media, and interacting with us. The preceding presentation has been brought to you by the Gear Network.